This podcast may contain graphic and or explicit content that may not be suitable for some listeners, especially kids like me. <laughs> Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Real Life Podcast, brought to you by The Thin Blue Line for Women. In this podcast, we open up and talk about real-life issues as they relate to first responders. It's raw, it's real, and it's about time. I'm Tamara, your host. Thanks for joining me. Are you looking for Thin Blue Line gear? It's available on our website at thinbluelineforwomen.com. That's Thin Blue Line, the number four, women.com. Show your support for law enforcement and get your Thin Blue Line gear today. Just click on shop at thinbluelineforwomen.com. Don't forget, you can listen to the Real Life Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, and on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. I really hope you've all heard of the HBO documentary titled Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. If you have, you're going to love this interview. And if you haven't, you're going to learn all about who Ernie and Joe are and the mental health unit that they work in. So sit back, get your favorite drink and relax and listen to my interview with Ernie from the Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. And I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with Ernie, the other half of the Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops HBO documentary. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So before we get into discussing the Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, can you just tell me and the listeners a little bit about yourself so that we all can kind of get introduced to you? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, I am a husband and a father. And I have been a police officer for 28 years. Uh, Currently, I'm assigned to a specialized unit uh, in a mental health unit, which I helped establish 12 years ago. Um, I've worked in a lot of different units. I've worked in mostly tactical units, um, the gang units, DWI units, patrol, field training officers, um, programs. So a little bit of everything. I'm an advanced instructor. So I've had a lot of different assignments throughout law enforcement, but currently my passion is responding to mental health crises. And so you, but you've been doing the mental health crises for just the last 12 years. That's correct. Yes. But before okay. that, we didn't have a unit. So if you can imagine that seventh largest city in the United States with no mental health unit. What city are you in? I'm in San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas. Okay. So, so then who, got this mental health thing going? Was, was it? I'm going to raise my hand. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I went to a training, <laughs> I went to a training uh, in 2003 put on by the Houston police department and it was the crisis intervention training. I remember and, going through those. Yeah. And then we came back to San Antonio and was asked to put together a program for our department and based on the resources that we have available here. And, um, you know, I heard one of our speakers, who's a civilian, come in and talk about her son that has mental illness. And she said something very profound. She said, one day, one of you officers might have to come to my house and there's a good chance you might shoot and kill my son. And I want you to know. Yeah. She goes, I want you to know that it's okay because you don't understand and you have a family and I want you to go home safe to your family. So what that told me was that she was resolved to the fact that because we had no training and we were ignorant to what mental health looked like, that we were going to use excessive force, kill her son, and she was okay with that. 
And that broke my heart. And I said, at that moment, myself and another officer in the class said, we're going to do whatever we can to get a mental health unit started and really push this training. So, because she can't be the only one that feels like this. Oh, of course not. No. Yeah. So that's kind of how it started. I joined the National Alliance on Mental Illness, became a, a board member there and just really saturated my life with anything mental health. Wow. So, okay. But are, are you... Tell me what the capacity is. Like, what what is what does your daily job look like? Do you do you go on patrol as a normal patrol officer in uniform, or are you just a mental health like specialist when you're out there? Like, how, what does that look like? Yeah, so, when we created the mental health unit, uh, one of the stipulations I requested that was granted by the chief, who of course you know he's he's the one that makes everything happen, not me. But I requested that we go out in plain clothes. I thought that was going to be a huge de-escalator, and I thought we'd be much more successful with that type of an approach, and that we drive unmarked cars for the privacy and to show respect and dignity to, to any of the patients that we came into contact with. And he agreed, and we've been very successful in doing that. Um, we can talk about the documentary here in a minute about how we respond. Um, you know, we, we do respond in plain clothes. We respond uh, to, with two two officers, you know, myself and my partner in the documentary, it's me and Joe uh, that gets followed to from call to call. Um, we're a 12 person unit. We have two detectives assigned to our unit and then one supervisor. Oh, OK. For some reason, I thought it was just you and Joe. So that makes sense. A 12 person unit. OK. Yeah, we started out with just two officers. It was myself and another officer. And um we were told we were going to be a six month pilot project and uh, <laughs> 12 years. Started, yeah, 12 years later, we were an <laughs> overnight success, right? That just took 12 years. <laughs> That's awesome. Now you're armed, correct? I am. I do. Uh, we carry our firearms. We keep everything, uh, you know, underneath our shirts. We'll, uh, we'll show our badge, which we carry it on a chain around our neck and then we'll put it away and then we'll just talk and have conversation and find out what we can do to help each other. Okay, now when you're driving around, um, you don't have a beat, obviously, because you're going to be responding to any crisis in in your area, in your whole county, right? Or are you city or county? I'm city. Okay, so you have you're practically you have the whole city is correct. yours, right? That's correct. Okay, so how? Tell me how the dispatcher dispatches you. What is the criteria that she has to follow? Or what? Or actually, actually, what are the questions that the nine one one dispatcher has to ask to get that? you know, channeled through the dispatcher to where he or she knows that you have to be dispatched, not a normal patrol unit. Right. So I'm glad you you spoke about the dispatchers because that's where it starts. Uh, we teach our dispatchers a 16 hour courses in crisis intervention training. So we give them scripted scenarios and role plays on what to ask when they feel like they're dealing with a possible mental health caller or if they're not sure, ask these questions anyway. Um, once that's flagged as a mental health related call, it goes on a screen in a queue for calls that are holding for service. <clears throat> we have access to that screen. Mm -hmm. If we're not tied up on a call already, we can click on that call and go to it and patrol never even gets dispatched. Okay. So it helps patrol continue to do what they're designed to do. And that's to respond to the 911 calls. Um, or patrol can get to a scene and realize they have <clears throat> expand, uh, went beyond their capabilities mm -hmm. to deal with this. And it's going to take much longer and it's going to need a lot more resources than they have available. And they'll call us to come out and relieve them and then take over the call. Or uh, another way that we get dispatched is calls that come in through our local mental health authorities crisis line. <clears throat> uh, and they get a lot of calls a day. And we may go out with a clinician as a co-responder unit uh, and respond with a mental health clinician and find out what the crisis is and what we can do to help. Wow. And and you've been doing this for, for exactly 12 years, working in this unit. Yes, 12 years. Wow. So obviously it's your passion. <laughs> it is. It is. So, okay, I have a, a, a question that you're probably not going to like, but I know that you've been asked this. You have you have to have been asked this. Um do you think that officers in your department um, may look down upon your unit as being too soft or being too friendly or being too social worky, social worker y? <laughs> if that's not a word, but do you know what I mean? Because there are some officers who don't like the social work 
aspect of, of your job. So can you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. We were nicknamed the hug program. Uh, when oh, we, there you go. <laughs> and I've, I've been told by officers, your tactics are terrible. Uh, why do you sit down with people? What are you doing? And so this goes so much deeper than just defensive tactics. You know, mental health to me, and I think you'll see in the documentary, is all about human connection. It's about meeting the person where they are in the moment, right? Trying to find out what has escalated this situation, being transparent and authentic in who we are, in our response, and then offering that type of help, uh, you know, that a person needs to get into recovery and, and become stable and, and live a, a lifestyle you know, that that is abundantly full of joy, if that's even possible for somebody with mental health, which I think it is, because I know not a lot of people with mental health uh, that do very well. In fact, everybody has mental health. It's just some are in a better place than others. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. So that's a good answer, because I, I know I know for sure that you have to be faced with that at, at times, you know. So so you used to be called the hug a thug. Um, but but is it? Is it more accepted now by officers in your in your area? It is, and I'll tell you why. The chief mandated in 2010 that every single officer on our department go through the 40-hour CIT training. So when they did, and some of them retired before they took this class, I'm going to be honest. They're like, you know what? I'm not taking that class. I'm done. I'll quit this department before I'm told, you know, that I have to do this. Whatever. But what we have found is that the officers that were most resistant to coming to the training were those that were most directly affected with mental health, whether it was within their own families, friends, neighbors, or themselves. Wow. And by the end of the training, where we had almost 100%, where now we're at 100% trained, these concepts are very well received. Our use of force has gone down. Now, is that correlation or causation? I don't know, uh, because the definition of use of force changes from time to time. Mm-hmm. I would like to think that when you teach de-escalation and um, and know what you're looking at when you're faced with mental health, then you can better respond to it. Now, you you talked about the dispatchers having to take a course, but there's a 16 hours. Correct. There's a 16 hours face to face and then another eight hours is online. And is that mandatory for them to take as well? It is. OK, so your entire department is compliant right now. That's correct. Wow. Okay, let's talk a little bit about about what we're going through right now today in, in this riot situation. Do you think if if uh, this is going to be such a hard question and a hard answer? Do you think if every single department made it mandatory for this forty hour course that our excessive use will go down? Or um, it's hard to ask that because I know that every cop in the United States has to take CIT training. It's mandatory. Well, not every state um, has, not every state has CIT training. So but they okay. I I wasn't aware of that. I thought no, that they did. So this no, is not federally mandated then. Oh no, not at all. A okay. Lot of it, a lot of okay. it is state mandated, and okay. with yeah, and with the state mandates, um, not everybody follows what's called the Memphis model of CIT training, which is a forty-hour training model. Some states do eight hour mental health first aid. Some of them do a 16 hour course. So there's no standardization okay. across the board for okay. CIT training. Okay. So then let me go back and ask that question again. Do you think that if every single department in the United States made it mandatory for their officers to take the 40 hour CIT course, do you think that excessive force will go down? What I do you think, think? You- I think use of force will go down, but I think it goes much deeper than just crisis intervention training. I think it goes into recruiting and then into the academy and the curriculum itself, um, where we're seeing some of the issues early on. And if I can Mm -hmm. expand on that, what I mean by that is let's start looking at recruiting. Who are we recruiting? You know, my partner, Joe, is a veteran. He was in the Marine Corps, Mm -hmm. but he was recruited uh, to join the San Antonio Police Department. And the department, the city, gets a stipend from the government when they hire a veteran. Mm. So a lot of veterans are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with undiagnosed mental health issues. You know, my partner was one of them. And he'll talk very openly about his diagnosis now. 
of PTSD and depression. And uh, so that's just one. One aspect is in recruiting. And then two, let's look at the curriculum of what they're teaching in training academies. They're very heavy handed on defensive tactics, which there's nothing wrong with that. Right. However, however, let's look at what your your average call load looks like in a day. Right. In the academy, they are preparing you really for war. The only difference between the police academy and a military boot camp is you get to go home at the end of the day. So what are they teaching you? Hey, watch this video. Look at this. This is an ambush. Look, this officer got shot. This officer got shot. We're going to go now and train and put two people against you trying to take your gun. And so you're graduating scared. You know, you're graduating thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to go out in the streets and someone's going to try and kill me. When, in fact, you graduate and you're getting calls for, can you help me? My daughter is 16 years old and she's suicidal or my neighbor's tree is dropping too many pecans in the pool. You know, I mean, you just you're right. prepare you for war. But what they need to prepare you for is better communication. And part of that, I think, if I could, is learning about yourself. Okay. And what I mean by that is academies hire people at the age of 21. The the male brain doesn't even stop developing until 27 years old. You know, so what would a police department look like if they didn't even hire until age 30, where an individual has some life experience? has dealt with some maybe some trauma in their life and knows and is better equipped cognitively how to deal with a very stressful situation, right? So I think introducing neuroscience at a basic level in academies, uh, neuro, uh, cognition neuroscience and, bio, and uh, biopsychology, I think would be very effective for you to learn something about yourself. Mm-hmm. In addition to ACEs, ad, uh, adolescent child or adverse childhood experiences, What that does is that measures the amount of trauma you experienced growing up through your life. Now, even if you have a lot of trauma, whether it's having your parents divorced or going through sexual assault or physical assault as a child, doesn't mean you won't be good, a good police officer. Mm -hmm. You may be able to communicate better with what you're going to be dealing with, where such as having a low A score or not going through much trauma doesn't mean you won't be a good police officer and be able to communicate. It just means you'll do it at a different level. But if you don't know what you don't know. So I think the more you learn about yourself and your own traumatic experiences growing up will better equip you for dealing with the community that's always in, you know, when they call 911, there's a crisis taking place. Right, right. Now, that's so interesting. So. So then how Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, that documentary that was that came out in 2019, correct? Correct. November 2019. So who had the idea? Where did it come from? How did all this start? So when we started the mental health unit in uh, 2008, we started getting a little local media coverage, you know, because it was something new. It was something we were doing. Well, that led to uh, a writer from the Atlantic named Ann Snyder that came out and rode with us and wrote a story called Policing with Velvet Gloves. That story got to ABC News and Byron Pitts, who came out and did a ride along with us. And that story ran nationally three times in one year, which was the most it it ever ran because police officers were being involved in deadly force situations with individuals that had mental health. Once that story went national, a filmmaker, Jen McShane from uh, Connecticut, wanted to come down and meet Joe and myself. Uh, she showed up, introduced herself as a, um, a a filmmaker. She didn't have a camera. She didn't have a crew. <clears throat> I wasn't sure what to think of her, <laughs> but really, but it was she was just trying to feel us out. And so that day, she rode with us. And I think what really caught her attention was the very first call we went on, because it was a individual at a group home that was um, acutely psychotic and having homicidal ideations of wanting to stab and kill a roommate. And uh, we got there, we talked to him, um, made him understand that it would be best that he go in to get some treatment at the time. And he agreed. And he started to walk towards our vehicle. And he said, well, I'm not riding in the, in the back of a police car. And I said, okay, that's fine. If you want to ride up front, that's fine. And the filmmaker kind of grabbed me by the arm and pulled me back and said, did you just say he could ride up front? <laughs> And I said, yeah, well, I mean, yes. 
And she goes, why? And my question was, well, why not? He's not in trouble. He's a patient. He's not a prisoner. And if it's more comfortable for him to ride up front, I'm fine riding in the back. And, she, you know, her being from the Northeast and, and traveling and being from New York quite a bit, I guess they don't have that type of response up there. It's quite different. Mm-hmm. And so she thought, you know what, there's a story here. And it's more than just the training and the response. There's true humanity, dignity, and human connection that can be made with this film. Right. Okay. With that, we're going to take a really quick break. We'll be right back. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm. Are you interested in CSI? or forensics? The Forensic Science Academy program has been recognized as the premier training program completely dedicated to students who are launching their forensic career. The Academy offers specialized hands-on training modules in basic and advanced crime scene investigation, forensic photography, fingerprint identification and classification, crime scene management, and coroner investigations. Instruction is offered in the form of weekend workshops, online courses, webinars, and seminars. Training at the Academy of Forensic Science will give students the competitive edge employers and agencies are looking for when hiring. Past graduates are now working as crime scene investigators, private investigators, forensic pathologists, coroner investigators, forensic nurses, forensic accountants, and even criminalists. The courses are taught by forensic professionals who are experts in the field and hold membership in the International Association for Identification and other professional forensic organizations. For more information, visit ForensicScienceAcademy.org. Again, that's ForensicScienceAcademy.org. Have you ever wondered what being a part of CSI is really like? If so, here's your chance to experience it. My book titled Through My Eyes, CSI Memoirs That Haunt the Soul, contains 11 personal accounts of the most grueling and heartbreaking crime scenes I worked during my 15 years in the Crime Scene Investigations Unit. While reading my book, you'll walk inside the crime scene tape with me. You'll catch a glimpse of what I saw, touched, smelled, and even tasted during an average workday. I'll take you on a difficult journey of memories, uncovering layers of emotional trauma left behind. So if you're considering a job in CSI, this is the book for you. Or if you're just wondering what it's like to work in CSI, again, this is the book for you. Through My Eyes is available in the ebook format and paperback on Amazon. All right, we're back with Ernie. So let's dive deeper into this documentary. I've watched this documentary. It's amazing. Um, I've received your poster signed by both you and Joe. Thank you again for that. I love it. It's up here on my wall. And um, so I watched it. I love watching shows like this because I I like watching cop things, but I like watching emotional things because I'm a girl. So I'm emotional and I like watching touchy feely things. That's just me. So this, this went over really well with me when I watched it. And this is something that I could get myself into. My master's is in marriage and family therapy. So I really am drawn to things like this. That's why it's fun talking to you about this, but let's go deeper. Um, when, when did you finally agree to, yes, we're going to do this documentary and here's how it's going to work. And how long did it take? Like answer, answer those questions for me. Yeah. So Jen pitched the idea that she wanted to go ahead and go forward with the documentary. And 
Joe and I, again, we're used to the media riding with us. So we were like, okay, yeah, no big deal. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. Not knowing that the filming was going to take place for three years. So oh. yeah, this, this the documentary goes a lot deeper into just while following us from call to call. It gets, it gets very, it got very intense because it, it came into our personal lives, you know, and um, there was tragedy within the department during that time. We had two officers shot and one was killed. Um, what I respected for Jen, the director, was that she knew her boundaries, not to um, want to pry into us going into the roll calls and pulling officers aside um, from those particular substations to check on you know, the coworkers to find out, Hey, are, are you dealing with this? Okay. What can we do to help you? Uh, because that's one of our jobs is the, you know, to make sure that internally we're doing the best we can with our own mental health, uh, which is a whole nother conversation. Right. right. So, but she never crossed that line. She gave us and respected that privacy part of it. Um, but she did follow us home. She followed us to school. She followed us to church. I mean, it, it took three years to film this documentary and we still had no idea really what it was going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't know what her vision truly was until she screened it for Joe and I privately uh, right before the release at South by Southwest. And the first time we saw it, you know, you're thinking, God, am I that fat? Why do I sound like that? <laughs> you, you just, you, you kind of miss a lot of the film uh -huh. and, because you're so focused on you. Right. And so I, I didn't have a whole lot of feedback other than this is good, but, I didn't understand the true essence of it. So we go to South by Southwest and it wins the grand jury award for empathy and craft. And I had no idea what that meant. And Jen was like, that's very, very good. I'm letting you know to hang on. Uh, wow. This thing's going to, this thing's going to do very well. So uh, we go on a film festival circuit. The film continues to win time and time again. And um, HBO ends up purchasing the film for three years which you can see now on HBO now on, uh, on your local cable service. Wow. So, okay. I have some questions that I ask people on Twitter to ask you. Um, I want to make sure we get to those. So, so let me just go ahead and ask these of you. And then I, I do want to talk about the documentary more because I have a, a, a couple more questions. Sure. So Jennifer Espinoza says, is this something that will possibly be rolled out to other agencies and police academies? I would love to. So the, the director has some money for outreach and her goal is to get this film into every police academy in front of every mayor, in front of every city council or county commissioner's court to watch, to say, look, this is a different type of approach to mental health. And not only can you deal with mental health in this way, you can deal with any type of disturbance, really. It's all about, are you using de-escalation skills, active listening mm -hmm. skills? Are you able to um, be compassionate, use common sense in dealing with people, see their perspective mm -hmm. of what's they going on? Heard. Right, they wanna be heard and they wanna feel like um, you're being transparent and equitable to where there's a favorable outcome, whether whether the outcome is favorable or not, if they're treated fairly in the process, it doesn't really matter what the outcome is, because at least you've been fair. And I think if you, mm -hmm. if you introduce this into academies and we'll see a much better police department and a much better attitude, you know, when it comes to approaching people. Here's a question I have. Do you think that this could be post certified? And that uh, our listeners probably a lot of them don't know peace officer standards of training. Do you think that this film could actually pass that you know peace officer standard of training, and and be a part of every academy? That is a good question. Um, you know, I haven't thought about that. I would love to to say you know let's show this in academies. Um, you know, the the issue is again you know when we go and we teach our cadets for forty hours. You know, I get in front of them on day one. And I say, look, this next 40 hours is not going to be sexy. I'm just telling you now. Right. We're not going to kick in doors. We're not going to chase them. Right? <laughs> we are going to learn how to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and for a lot of y'all, 21 years old or whatever, you don't know how to talk to somebody yet. Right. And by the end of the, the week, they're very confident in their skills. Um, you know, they go out and do their ride longs. Even their FTOs are kind of impressed with the way the cadets are stepping up. So I definitely think that. 
um, this has real potential to make progress throughout, especially now when we're looking at police reform. This is a perfect opportunity just to say, look, this goes right along with CIT training, but it also is a film of human connection and public service. Right, right. Now, Dylan Collier asks, how much larger should San Antonio PD's mental health unit be? And how do we get how do we get it to that size? Because right now it's only 12 person unit, right? Right. And so it's in the unit is very multifaceted. So let me explain how our unit works. Um, two of the officers are assigned to what's called the program for intensive care coordination. Those two officers, which I'm a part of, are specifically giving 100 patient load of the most emergency detained patients in the city. And our job is to go out and pre-engage the individual before the crisis. And we are paired with a paramedic and a mental health clinician to bring wraparound services to try to keep an individual out of the hospital. And into treatment, we pay for medications, um, we we pay for everything. We do all the ID recovery. We do everything that, that is a barrier for treatment. That's two officers. We've got six officers assigned to threat assessment because we get a lot of threats that come in through social media, through the, we're attached to fusion. So we have the FBI, the US Marshals, ICE, we have everybody in our office. And we also have to look into all the threats that come in. Are these threats mental health related? Are they legitimate threats that need, you know, to type up warrants and, and on a criminal level? And that's a very busy part of what mental health does also. We've got two officers that respond to patrol for the calls that patrol is calling in. And then we're also responsible for all the training um, as well. So there's a lot of moving parts with a very small amount of officers. So how do we grow it? It has to become a priority within the department. The the issue with that is every unit's a priority. Right, right? (laughs) exactly. Your your DWI unit's a priority. Right. Your, Your homicide unit's a priority. Everybody needs personnel. So mm-hmm. where do you put officers? Mm-hmm. It's typical, right? Because there's only so much budget, so much money, and that's so far above my pay scale that I just sit back and hope that we get more officers. Now, do you, did you guys receive a grant to run this program, or can you get a grant to to get more officers? We, so we did come across a grant a few years ago that helped with two officers. Okay. And what that did was that allowed um, – them to hire two extra officers as cadets. They were able to bring, once they graduated, then we were able to bring two officers in off the street and then bring them in our unit. Um, Once that grant expired, the department picked up the the cost of that and we just continued to roll with it. So uh, we haven't expanded now in a few years. We've been at this number for a little while now. Gotcha. Now, Holden Logan asks, how did you come up with the idea of a mental health unit? Uh, I think you covered that already in the beginning, but you can you can say yeah, that again. Yeah, again. Uh, but I want to mention her name because her name is very important. Janine, okay. yeah, Janine Owens, um, dear woman. You know, she came in and, and talked to us, and and she talked to us about her son again. Y'all have heard the story. I, I told it about. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was important is her son passed away a few years ago, and um, you know we stayed in contact with Jeanine the entire time because her son had um, a very um, serious mental health issue. And we were constantly having to to help him provide services. And when he passed away, her biggest fear, first of all, was that she was going to pass away before him and then not know what would happen to him. Um, He ended up passing away and she asked if I could speak at his funeral. And, oh, my gosh. Aww. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I leaned over in her ear and I told her, I said, you remember what your biggest fear was, right? Mm-hmm. I remember. I said, I want you to take a deep breath and rest easy because now he's resting easy. And then I went up and, um, you know, I, I gave my condolences and I spoke to the people that attended the funeral and was able to give closure. Right. That's awesome. It just brought tears to my little eyes here. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, Brad Pridgen. He's asking, um, how did you get into law enforcement in the first place? And what's your background? Well, you told us your, your background in the beginning, but how, how did you get into law enforcement? We didn't, we didn't get into that. Yeah, so at a very, you know, and it's, it's different now because, you know, I hear it used to be a calling. Now it's, you know, people that are just looking for a job. But for me, <laughs> 
it was at a very young age. I mean, um, in, in elementary school, I remember being a patrol. And, uh, you know, they put that little orange strap around you with a little badge and you hold a stop sign. I thought, man, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> I get to hold this out and cars are going to stop, you know. Um, so I got my first taste of law enforcement uh, when I was like 10 years old or something. Um, but, you know, I always had that desire and I was always drawn to the um, to the career field of law enforcement. I've, I've always had a job where it seemed like an officer was present for security. And I always just hung around them and talked to them about what it was like. And then in high school, my senior year, they offered a law enforcement class and a retired detective from the San Antonio Police Department taught the class. And I knew right then, I was like, this, you know, destiny's calling. I just need to hurry up and turn 21. We can make <laughs> this happen. Now in Sacramento, where I worked, you only had to be 18, but you couldn't work and patrol. You had to go to a jail or a courthouse until you were 21. Yes, Sheriff's yeah. Department, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Brad Pridgen also wants to know, and this is a running joke on Twitter between him and I and, and Benjamin Tyler Smith. He wants to know, do you like sweet tea, Brad? Come on. I'm from Texas. I love sweet tea. What would I be if I didn't? <laughs> it's disgusting. Now, see, he tells me that I should like it because I live in Tennessee, but I'm not from here. I was born and raised in California. I moved here four years ago when I retired. I don't like sweet tea. It's gross. I never liked tea. It's yummy Look. goodness. It is no, yummy it's not. goodness. <laughs> so there's your answer, Brad. Yes, he likes sweet tea. Real questions. Come on. Um, okay. Can we talk? Can we get in more into your documentary? Sure. There is a part of the documentary that I remember where you and Joe walk into, I don't even know what it is, a DMV or I don't know, some some city building, I guess. I don't know. I don't even remember where it was now. It was a courthouse. A, oh, a courthouse. Okay. Uh, so, and and I and I I think I remember the documentary mentioning that you know other officers were questioning your tactics and like why are you sitting down and and it does to a lot of police officers in uniform it does catch them off guard at first you know what are you doing sitting down this guy's standing up you know you know he could just he could just snap at any moment and you're just sitting down chilling so can you talk about that a little bit and 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 does that does that scenario feel good to you is that comfortable for you to do did that take some time to learn to just um, sit down and and talk to people it feels incredible for me, and I'll tell you why. Um, I guarantee you, if I use a human approach to sit down and talk with somebody, they're going to tell me a lot more than they're going to tell you in uniform standing over them and talking down to them. If I can get down to their level and speak to them eye to eye and see them, and I don't mean see them with my eyes. I mean, I need them to take their mask off of what they're hiding behind, the pain that they're hiding behind, where I can see inside of them and let them know, I see you. You know, Joe says that in the film. That means yeah. that you don't have to hide from me. You don't have to pretend with me because I see you. And now I'm here to help you. And that, that part of the human connection that takes place is so vitally important for trust and rapport and showing, you know, I tell the cadets, and I'm gonna be honest with you, um, and it's in the, it's in the film, People just want you to show up and give a shit. I mean, mm -hmm, that's, true. Mm -hmm. that's what it is. And the law is black and white, but humanity isn't. There's all colors in humanity. And we need to be able to focus on that person, not the problem, and focus on connection, not correction. Yeah, because something got you there in the first place. Somebody, somebody, you know, had to call 911 and say, this, there's something wrong with this guy. Well, what's wrong with the guy? You know, what's wrong with the person? And 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 they want to be heard. That's just the bottom line. They want they want you to hear them and hear them out. How can I help you? And 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 I think if you will ask a lot of people that on calls, I think it would actually stun them and they're like, Whoa, you're asking me how you can help me? You well, know, if, I you, think yeah. if you empower somebody and yeah. let it be part of the problem yeah. solving the part solution. of it. Yeah, let them be part of the solution. Yeah. You're going to have a much better outcome. Oh, yeah. Because that's you're not going to be able to get away from that human nature um, 
part of us. It's all in us. We all want to be heard. You're not going to be able to get away from that. Right. So talk more about the uh, documentary. Are, is there anything that you, after you've watched it after three years, is there anything that stood out to you that, that you, that made you uh, like very proud of your unit? Is there anything that just stands out as your favorite part? Um, my favorite part for me, and I know we've been asked this and Joe has a different answer, but for me, it was going to the film festivals and being validated. And what I mean by that is we walk into a theater. We're kind of hidden. Nobody knows we're there. We show the film 96 minutes long. People walk in not knowing you at all. Mm-hmm. 96 minutes later, you get on stage for a Q&A. And you have people, grown men in tears, Aww. women in tears, saying, that was my mom on a bridge. Um, I wish you were, you and Joe were around before my son killed himself. And they're telling you the most intimate details in their life. These wow. are total strangers that in 96 minutes felt connected to you right. because of the film. So for me, it validates all the um, work and progress and prayer that I put into wishing for this unit to, to happen. And, you know, I look back now 12 years later and we're, we're, we're not where I want to be, but we're here and we've made a footprint and we've saved thousands of lives. I'm, I'm certain of it. Oh yeah, I am too. And, and like, I, like I said, I'm going to go back to the training, the mandatory training that you guys have. I'm wondering if with, with everything that's going on right now, with all this police reform, if that will be a mandatory training, the 40 hours of that CIT training. Well, you got to think departments are decentralized. So what I mean by that is yeah. some academies are eight months long, some are 12 yeah. weeks long. So mm-hmm. there's no, nothing standardized about a police academy at all. Mm-hmm. Um, it depends on the size of the academy, the size of the city. Um, so e- at some point, there's going to have to be some type of standardization for all officers, whether that's a use of force curriculum, a CIT training, something to where at least all the officers across the country are on the same page, you know, when it comes to certain types of, you know, calls that they're going to go on. Like just, you just said, the excessive force and the CIT, those need to be standardized across the board. It just makes at, sense, right? <laughs> at least those two. Yeah, you think. Yeah. Um, well, this has been a wonderful interview. I'm going to look at Twitter one more time, but I think we've answered um, everyone's questions on there. But it was so good talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If 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 you guys do not know where to go watch this HBO special, can you please tell everyone how to log on their computer and how to watch it, how to log on their TV? How, where, just where do they go to watch this? To yeah, watch just, the special. Yeah, if you have a smart TV or a computer, just go to HBO and do the seven-day free trial. It will cost you absolutely nothing. Uh, scroll down to the documentary section. And click on Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. After you watch the documentary two or three times, uh, go ahead ahead and cancel your subscription. If you don't want to keep HBO, again, it will cost you nothing. But then please leave some feedback uh, to to me or if you go on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook to ernieandjoethefilm.com. You can find me at estevens0845 on Twitter and just let me know what you think of the film and um, and be brutally honest. You know, I love having open conversation and dialogue about uh, the documentary and where we can go from here. Now, what about little posters? Are you still handing those out and signing them? Now, don't put me on the hook for a bunch of posters. <laughs> <I'm- laughs> I've got a few. Uh, I can always order more. Uh, <laughs> so as long as I'm not signing 5,000 of them, I guess we'll be okay. Oh, well, I don't have that big of a listenership yet. I wish I did. But I love my poster. And Joe did write, I see you on that poster. It brings it brings tears to my eyes. So you've been amazing. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for the documentary. I mean, I cannot thank you enough. Just keep doing what you're doing. We I'm sure we all appreciate you. Oh well, thank you. I appreciate you and and having me on. Uh, I respect everything you've done. I've read your book through my eyes and uh, incredible. Congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. That was a hard one. That's hard, hard to write. Yeah. I that took imagine. a while. Yeah. But you read the whole thing, right? I did. And um, if I could just tell a short story, if we have sure. time. Sure. Of course I, we do. Um, you know, when you and I were trying to set up a date for this interview, 
Um, we went back and forth and said, hey, how about a Sunday? I'm like, yeah, Sunday's fine. And then you shot me an email that said, well, that's Father's Day. Is that going to be OK? I said, yeah, no problem. Well, after we decided on that, um, I picked up your book to read it. I just finished two other books by Donna Brown and one by uh, Chief Andy Harvey. And I started your book. And you'll understand this when I say I believe in a God incidents, not a coincidence. And what I mean by that is I started to read your book and then I put it down. I said, okay, take a deep breath because this is going to be a different kind of read for me. And I got to page Roman numeral seven, which are for millennials. That's the V and two little eyes. <laughs> and, and you wrote something you wrote and I'll quote it. This book was difficult to write. And I poured many tears over it and into it. But once I learned to write through my pain, my stories began to flow and the healing process began. So I had to write a question down at the bottom of that page. And that question was, am I ready to heal? The reason I asked that question was because four years ago on Father's Day, I was working an overtime shift, uh, night, nighttime overtime shift, 10 at night till six in the morning on patrol. And I got a call for a major accident and I was about a half a mile away. So I responded. I was the first officer on the scene and it was a vehicle that had rolled off the highway and down an embankment. And when I pulled up, the lights were still on. It was a Yukon or a Tahoe. I can't remember. Uh, vehicle parts were spread all over the all over the roadway. And I see a young man walking around in a circle on a cell phone. So I go up to him. I said, hey, are you OK? Are you hurt? And, you know, he's saying, you know, I messed up. I made a mistake. Whoever he was talking to, it ended up being his parents. But he goes, I made a mistake. And he's just in shock and he's really not responding to me. So I look around and I see a, a young lady laying on the ground on her back. And um, I, 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 I asked the guy, I say, hey, what's her name? And he tells me her name and I go over to her. And she has the brightest blue eyes in the world. Beautiful crystal blue eyes. But her eyes show terror. And she's making that noise that, you know, you've heard before. Uh, we are gasping for life and I'm calling her by her name and I'm holding her hand and I'm telling her, just hang on helps on the way. And I'm calling for the ambulance to please hurry up. Um, she continues just to wheeze deeper and deeper and her, her breathing's getting more shallow. Uh, the EMS arrives and um, immediately they cut her shirt off and uh, she has like a floral print bra on now that that's important. And I bring that up for a reason. Uh, she takes her, her last breath as I'm holding her, her hand and EMS straps on the, uh, CPR, uh, machine now that does the automatic compressions. And usually with that, you have a pretty good outcome and they are starting the rescue breathing. Well, I'm looking over at the monitor and I'm seeing, you know, the little ticks going up and I'm thinking, okay, good. She heard she's got a heartbeat, but the paramedic tells me, no, that's the machine. So they leave it on her for about five minutes and I'm continuing to talk to her and whisper in her ear, you know, just, just, just breathe. And then I hear one of the paramedics say to turn it off. And I looked at him. I said, don't you dare, you know, don't you dare turn this off. Don't do it. Please leave it on. And they looked over their shoulder at their lieutenant or lieutenant said, just leave it on. Mm -hmm. So about another six or seven minutes goes by and they said, we have to turn it off. Um, she, she's gone. Oh, my God. And, um, you know, so they bring over the yellow sheet and they cover her up. And um, then I have to collect her property and I have to put it in the property room. And her cell phone is receiving text messages from daddy. Mm. And it's Father's Day. Oh, my God. And he's asking, you know, please text me. Let me know you're OK. Let me know when you get home. We're worried about you knowing that in a couple hours they're going to receive a knock on the door that their little girl's not coming home again. The reason I bring up her floral print bra is because about a year ago, I'm shopping with my daughter and we go into a store and I see that exact same print oh. on her bra. And immediately I, I get angry. I get mad. I'm like, don't, you're not getting it. And she didn't even want it. She, I said, you're not getting that. And she's like, looking at me, it's not even my style. Dad, what are you talking about? I'm like, don't even ask for this one. And, um, I bring that up because when I said, am I ready to heal with that question on that page? I want to ask you a question. Mm. 
if I heal, does that mean I'm going to forget? Because I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget her memory. I don't want to forget anything about her, even though it's it hurts because I went to the funeral and I met the parents in the family room. And I told him, I know you have a thousand questions. And I was in my class A uniform. And the mom was the most broken person I've ever seen in my life. And I gave him my number and I said, I don't have a lot of answers, but if you ever want to talk, I'm here. And I never got a phone call. So it's not that I was looking for closure, but I feel like as a police officer, it's my burden, it's my cross to to carry to continue on the memories of some of the people that we come across. And that's what your book did for me. And it was very powerful. And I needed to read that. And I needed this conversation to take place today. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know how to. I don't even know what to say now because you've had me in tears the whole time. I did my crying this morning because I think about about her every Father's Day. That's wonderful. And, And it is okay to keep thinking of the people. I think by healing, it doesn't mean that we're forgetting it means that we are able to remember without breaking down, without going crazy. You know, it's, it's. That's a hard question. It, it's a hard. <laughs> yeah, I can't describe I, it. Yeah, I want to break yeah. down. I, I want to cry for her because, mm-hmm. because I don't know if anybody else is right now. And mm-hmm. I, and I want, she, she deserves those tears still today. And I feel like I own those for her, you know, and in your book, you talk about tears that cleanse. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if those are cleansing tears. I think so, because every time I picked up the pencil to write and then to type and I would cry and then I would shut the laptop and say, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. That's why it took me so long to write this darn book was because I just kept crying. And finally, I just I said, "Okay, buck up and just write. And. And I I forced myself to just write through my tears. I just said, okay, I'm crying, but I'm just going to keep writing because obviously I need to heal. And I, and I do feel every time that I revisited that book through editing, the editing process over and over and over, I did cry over and over, but it got easier and it got better for me. Yeah. It's just, I can, I can, um, I can talk about them more without crying so much, if that makes sense. It does. And I'm kind of at that point in my life with 28 years on, I'm coming to the end. So it's time to really take a real look at myself. Mm -hmm. And thank you you for writing this. Oh, I, I, you're welcome. It was therapeutic for me. I did it for me, but I, I think I put it in book form so it could help other people. So that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that it helped you. I was going to end this podcast, but I have another question from somebody on Twitter and I think it's a very good ending question. This is perfect. Okay. So Clarissa Aguilar asks, what's the most difficult lesson learned through this work? Wow. Um, I think for me, the most difficult lesson throughout the entire process, whether it was filming the documentary, um, dealing with people, was making that connection, you know, looking at their perspective. It's so easy in law enforcement to get caught up in you know, once I hear three or four minutes about what's going on, I already know the outcome. And that is so unfair to the people that you're dealing with because you're getting just a very small snapshot of what's going on in the moment. Mm-hmm. And you really have to dig into what, what was going on three, four days ago, three, four months ago, three, four years ago that got you to this point. And I look at it like this, you know, when that when a paramedic responds to a call, they put gloves on. They assume that everybody ha- could have an infectious disease. Mm-hmm. For us, I need to understand that every time I respond to a call, somebody's been affected by trauma. And if I can approach it in that manner, it will better equip me to make that connection with them. Wow. I, that's perfect ending to the podcast. Thank you. You're <laughs> right. You're totally right. But I had something else I was just going to say when you said that. Okay, that's what I was going to say. That's why you need a specialized unit because you you just mentioned that that person is not having a crisis just at that moment. It 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 started a day ago or a week ago or a year ago or even five years ago. And patrol units don't have time to go 
on that call for two hours and three hours like you do. They have to go call to call to call to call and clear that queue out. And there are calls pending and stacked up against each other. They don't have time for that. That's why this unit, this specialized unit is needed across America. It is. And the, diff- yeah, the difficulty in that, though, is the average size police department is 12, I, is 12 officers. You're right. I know. I get that. So, you know, what, how do you, do you, what do you do? Yeah, how do you send one of them to a 40 hour class without right. running up an overtime bill? And how do you do a dedicated unit? But right. today I, I say this. You can't afford not to anymore. I know. You just can't. It's a vicarious liability. If the training's out there and the need from the public is there, mm-hmm. we have to be better equipped mm-hmm. to deal with you know crises in general. And it starts with us. We have to own that and take responsibility for it. And I think that's where grants can come into play. You get grants for these types of units, and then that allows you to hire more officers to take care of these kind of things. Yeah, grants are a great start. They run out. Um, Departments slowly have to absorb the cost. But, you know, it's that's just part of budgeting for the community's needs. And Mm -hmm. we as officers, I love what Andy Harvey says in his book, just because you put on a, a uniform doesn't. Uh, make you not a part of the community, it makes you even more a part of the community. Mm -hmm. So we need to really listen to what the needs are and then respond appropriately. Right. Okay. Thank you so much again, Ernie. Now, one more time, where can people go to get this, to watch watch the Ernie and Joe HBO special? Yeah. Yeah. Please go to HBO, use it on your smart television, your tablet, your computer, just download the HBO app and go to the documentary section. And look up Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. Do the seven-day free trial. It will cost you nothing. You're welcome to cancel your subscription after you watch the documentary. And please leave feedback. I would love to hear back from everybody that watches it. Awesome. Thank you, Ernie. And tell Joe hello. Thank you both for what you're doing. You're welcome. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. If you're struggling with thoughts of suicide, you don't have to be alone. You can make a confidential, safe call now at this phone number, 206-459-3020. Safe Call Now is a confidential 24-hour crisis referral service for all public safety employees, all emergency services personnel, and their families. Again, the number is 206-459-3020. You can also call Copline at 1-800-267-5463. If you're not a first responder, you can reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. You don't have to be alone.